with all of our, sorry, not victims, uh, guests that come on here, um, we asked them about um, a few social issues, because students yeah. are really interested in the, yeah, um, yes. particular social issues. Mm. Um, so the standard one is um, marijuana reform, mm -hmm. or, or drug reform in general, what do you think? Yeah. No, against, right, and yeah. I suppose that comes through from my criminal um, law background rather than my time in West Auckland, but, um, <laughs> you know, I just think it's all very well, at a liberal intellectual um, level I can understand the arguments for reform and for de decriminalisation but actually when you get out into vast swathes of the Bay of Palinti right. um, uh, so it, it, so it theory, is a really... theory it might work in practice, it's a bad thing that's basically it. Okay, yeah. what about the purchase age of alcohol? Um, I would probably raise it yeah, for, I would probably for raise it. Across fact, the board to 20? Yeah, I would. I mean, if you look at all the evidence that the select committee I was on, it's all for raising, right? I mean, there's no... So if you take an evidence-based approach, and I'm, I'm, I must admit I don't always do that, sometimes the value's based, but on evidence, it's a no-brainer. OK. Um, at, but 20 is high enough? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, look, I, I practically understand that there are 19-year-olds that drink, but I think, again, if you look, and I, you know, and I was one of them, right? Yeah. But I think if you look, again, at the evidence in terms of the 14, 15, 16-year-olds that drink and the problems, they're raising it as a way of, of dealing with that to some extent. OK, so you kind of have the same argument, I think, we've had a, a few times here, that um, it's kind of OK, maybe a blind eye could be turned to those people that are under the age of 20, but if you lower the, the purchase age down to 18, you're then turning a blind eye to, 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 to um, some extent, 17, yeah. And I know that I know that's not neat, and I know people will be critical of that. And it's it's, but I, you know, I think that's the reality. I mean, I think lowering the purchase age has shown in the US. There's very clear evidence on this in terms okay. of driving stats that you know you, you lower it, you end up with much younger drinking, and that's not a good okay. thing. Gay marriage? Or, or can I jump in there? Oh, you've got a we've got a correction here. There's actually a lot of evidence that says our increase in the drinking age and the cross the board national drinking age has actually made things worse because it's made it a taboo right. and people find a way to get in there and drink and cause more problems. There's more alcoholism, there's probably more um, emergencies because people don't seek help. So I would actually take issue with that. Well, comment. I'm thinking of, um, I hear you say, I'm, I'm um, thinking of Professor Babor, who's sort of um, an American, um, probably the most preeminent alcohol um, um, academic in the world. And he says, what happened when they raised the age to 21 across the board in America is the accidents um, for 14, 15, 16 year olds just dropped away. And it's a convincing argument that he makes that it does make a difference. It's it's, it's, it's a lot more than legislating though, I mean if you take just the agree. Um, American exchange students who are under 21 in Dunedin and their attitude to drinking as an example, like it's a cultural thing. To totally agree. You need agree. to learn how to drink. And totally agree. So that's <laughs> you need to learn how to drink. <laughs> well, I like yeah. that. So that's an interesting question, I mean I, I, I take your pragmatic arguments and you know they have a lot of merit, but just thinking sort of freely for a moment, what, what about in some sort of you know European or Mediterranean countries mm. where there, you know, there's in some places no drinking age mm. but young people just tend to not drink because it's a cultural you know, thing. Would you yeah. be happy with that sort of scenario oh, look, if I, it, it could exist? You know? I would if it could exist, right? Yeah. But that was the Sir Geoffrey Palmer argument back in the late 80s, that we were going to become sort of this um, uh, Riviera type South Pacific place where people quaffed a little red wine with, with lunch, but sadly that hasn't um, eventuated necessarily. So yeah, if, if we could culturally be there, I would, but I agree with the point raised, it is deeply cultural. and. A lot of New Zealanders just need to grow up. OK. Actually, I have a, I have a follow-up question to take in a way. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of the time New Zealand compares itself outward all the time, and that is an example, saying we could be like Europe, but also we say we could be like Australia a lot, and why? That's my question. Be like Australia why, and why? Why, do we have, why like are we Australia? obsessed with being like Australia? Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, look, I, I couldn't live in Australia long term, right? <laughs> I just think we're actually culturally quite different. People talk about how similar we are. I actually think we're very different countries, you but, know? Like There's, Don Brash and stuff. I know, obviously, you're not Don Brash isn't your leader, but like the... the <laughs> Like saying that our economy should be more like Australia's and things like that. Like, why do we do that? Yeah. Oh, look, economically, it's not necessarily about being like Australia. It's just about being wealthier, right? And call me old-fashioned, but I even think that's a good thing. I mean, it means you know you have more options. So, so that's the thing there. But culturally, um, you know, I just think we're a softer. Um, uh, dare I say it, kind of people in New Zealand, and I kind of <laughs> like that. OK, so another moral question, gay marriage. Yeah, um, not sure. I certainly am interested in the gay adoption issue. OK. And I think we, 
in course need to have a, a systematic reform of adoption laws in general. I mean, there's, we, we sort of adopt one, two hundred people in New Zealand at the moment, uh, children in New Zealand at the moment. So I think there's real issues there, and I'd be prepared so, to look at that. Gay marriage. I mean, I am hedging my bets, but I'd want to sort of think about it and think it through. Okay, civil unions. Yeah, happy yeah, with? yeah relaxed about that. Okay. What about um, fashion? Fashion. <laughs> now you've made a few statements in the past about the decline in fashion sense <laughs> of politicians. Well, I this think. was Trekkies um, in Parliament. I mean, yeah, man. yeah. I, I've dressed up a bit more. I like I've, this. I've, I've, I've I like this. Uh, this is good. Uh, precisely because you come along. I, I did bring my tie. But I note the red. I note the red socks, though, mate. Oh, you yes. you know. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, um, so. Is it, how important is it to you for politicians to be wearing ties <laughs> and looking proper? Is that I, I do, look, look, again, maybe it's the, I don't know, it's the Tory and West Auckland syndrome or something, you can analyse it later, but I do think that you should dress like what you are, right? Yep. And I feel it's a privilege to be a member of Parliament. I know this is, you know, some will say, well, what, a, what, a, what an idiot, right? But I think it's a privilege to be an, an MP and I want to dress like it's a privilege, right? So, you know, to some extent, this is, makes me sound like a 70-year-old, not a 35-year-old, but you know what? Actually, when we're in Parliament, we should look like members of Parliament representing the privilege so that what, that is. So what about some of those that might say, myself included, in fact, um, that that's all a bit arcane, and sh shouldn't it be the people's sort of representation or, you know, forum yeah. where everyday people can come along and, um, you know, it's, it's y maybe you're suggesting yeah. some arcane sort of elitist uh, sort of... But I think um, you would also standards. argue that actually we're not everyday people, right? In the yeah. sense that we are members of parliament, we get paid a lot more than um, average New Zealanders. Mm. Um, dare I say it, we have the perks um, of office, which I, I, I think are absolutely necessary. Yeah. Actually, I need to be able to fly to Dunedin and so yeah, on and so sure. forth. Um, but, you know, we're not ordinary New Zealanders at one level. We are members of parliament. We are in the House of Representatives. And I think, you know, Personally, if I turned up in a Aloha shirt, would I be taking um, the dignity and the seriousness of, of the office that I've got um, seriously? I don't think I would be. Okay, so who are the best dressed people, apart from yourself in Parliament? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I have to think long oh, okay. hard. This Actually, is the bit where you go. <laughs> this is the headline coming here, yeah, eh? yeah. I can see it. I can see it. I, look, I think actually. Um, with all those cabinet, wanting to get into cabinet comments. So John Key is actually a good dresser, right? He has yeah. a good suit. He actually, gets it from RJB, I think it is, in Auckland. He's a good dresser. Okay. Actually, there seems to be a divide on Tony Ryle. What's your, uh, fun, <laughs> thumbs up or thumbs down? <laughs> um, some days it's up and some days it's down. Eh? Uh, okay. he, sometimes he gets it right, sometimes he gets it very wrong. But, you know, I like the boldness of Tony A bit of colour. Right? A bit of yeah, colour. A bit of colour. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I've only met you once before and it was at a conference at Parliament mm. um, talking about political rhetoric. Mm. And you had some quite interesting views on the standards of, of, of speaking in Parliament, yeah. essentially, of speeches. Mm. And uh, I just wondered, wondered if you could have, you know, yeah. talk about that some more, about who, who does it well, who does it badly. Yeah. especially in terms of parties. So I think the basic point that I'm trying to make is, look, um, the culture of Parliament is an oral one. To some yeah. extent, the Greens, Māori Party have gotten away from that a bit, where they have a pre-prepared written speech, but actually I think the most powerful speech is one from the heart, uh, not an academic exercise where you're really sort of conveying some points. Um, as I said at the conference, because Shane Jones was there, but also I do genuinely think at his best he's very, very good, right? And um, I remember at that conference we were at, he talked about two or three points, you know, mm. two or three points, mm. you know, really get to the pith of an mm. issue. So he is exceptional. Um, on our side, Chris Finlayson um, can be very, very good. Um, Jerry Brownlee can be um, o o o on a good day. He's he's unbeatable. So there, there are still those aspects. But I do think um, it's sad that we sort of have got down to this kind of pre-prepared speech thing. So it's the minor parties you think that do less well in the chamber. I, I think they are the offenders. Yeah, I do. Offenders. Okay. Yeah, so I think. So is that just because they're smaller? They have to cover more portfolios. They can't have it all up here. They have to read it off a page. It probably is part of the MMP dynamic where um, they uh, are less about, I oh, really think of the Greens here, personality, more about brand. Um, so they are, I think, and okay, you can say it's a legitimate view, they are reading a speech for Hansard and perhaps for the internet. 
But right. my point is actually a speech in Parliament is for the other members of the House of Representatives and the effect that it has there on the mood and the feel and the tone of debate. Okay, you've mentioned MMP, so I, I, and I see in the National Business Review today, I think it is. That'd be your favourite yeah. paper, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> not all the time. Uh, now I see you've got a. Uh, it's reported that you have come out of the closet as a <laughs> as a yeah. anti MMP um, yeah. uh, advocate. Yeah, so yeah. you want to change to what supplementary member? Yeah, I do. Yeah, you know, I just think that look, all systems are flawed. You know, I think mm. we can agree on that. All systems have their sure. pros and their cons. But I do think, and partly it's the contrarian in me. I'm yeah. I'm, I'm annoyed, frankly, that no one else is oh, arguing so against am I. MMP. I'm annoyed right. that there's not a proper debate yeah. going on. I want to see a debate yeah. on this. So I was quite pleased that you came out yeah. and you put forward at least a point of view and yeah. then we can at least debate it because all the parties, national included, seem to be not wanting to discuss the referendum. What's look, I think I think it's so. If you look at the left, uh, Labor and the Greens really have a block voice for MMP. Okay, and that, I think that personally is is, is it's sad. Not, it's not an official line, or is it between those? Oh, those I, I look. I think it verges on that. Okay. Actually, I can think of, and this is middle east second hand, but I know of one or two Labor MPs who I think have views different to or or less supportive of MMP, um, but they feel very much that they can't go along right. with that. I mean, I think in our party, look, you, I think you will hear a range of views. I don't think anyone's sort of taken the time, a journalist hasn't gone round with the mic and asked people. I think you would have a, a, a genuine spectrum of views. Right. So, I mean, that's a good point. Are the media not really coming up to the level on the referendum? Are they not exploring think, it enough? I think there's a number of things going on here. I mean, one of them is, and I'm not trying to sort of give you a party uh, vote national broadcast, mm. but I do think we've had stable good government for three years. You can worry about the pros and cons. That makes a case against MMP more difficult, right? Yeah. But my, my point is, actually, there are systemic things with MMP that over time will come again that are problems with the system that we should be thinking about. So I think there's that. I just genuinely think there's also Rugby World Cup, yeah. um, arguably RENA, um, Canterbury, global financial sure. crisis, all those things that make a debate on this difficult. Sure, but we'd probably agree that this is of greater importance in a long-term 